Welcome back, everybody. This is Gemology for Schmucks. I'm your host, Peter Nelson, and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the anatomy of gemstones today. All right, now, why is the anatomy of a gemstone important? Is it just some more vocabulary you can jot down in your notebook? That way you have something cool to show off at a party? No, we're not that geeky. We are. We are that geeky. However, this is more important than that. The reason that the anatomy of a gemstone is important is when you're looking at a gemstone, whether it's online or in person, this gives you the terminology that you need in order to communicate those things, things you might notice, to the gem dealer, the person who owns it. So if you can't communicate using the proper words, you know, the top part of the stone or the bottom part of the stone, people think you look like a schmuck. So what we're going to do today is drive out that shame and we're gonna give you the tools you need to talk about this properly. So let's get into it. As I move this stone around, you can see all sorts of geometric shapes at the bottom of the stone. These shapes are all caused by something called facets. So any flat part of the stone, you can see there's kind of an octagon on top of the stone, and there's lots and lots and lots of tiny flat areas. These are all called facets. The most obvious part of a stone, perhaps, is this wide part. It's very important when you're thinking about setting it in jewelry, because that's the area that's going to get a hug from the jewelry. It's what's going to hold it up in your ring or on your pendant. So this wide part right here, this line that goes right across, is called the girdle. You can think of those old guys that come and move your, your couch and your piano from your house to another house. You might see them strap a belt around their back so they don't throw their back out. That's also called a girdle. What is this flat plane at the top? Now, if we look at the gemstone like this, you can see that it's parallel with the girdle, and that's what we call the table. This area that is on top of the stone, this one facet right here, is called a table. Now, everything from the girdle up is called the crown. The crown sits on your head, right? So we have a girdle, everything above that is the crown, and this one facet right in the middle here is called the table. Now what is below the girdle? Everything from this line down is called the pavilion. So if we turn it pavilion side up, you can see that it comes to a point. Now, if you've ever seen anything medieval, if you've seen the tents that kings and queens stay in when they go on a hunting party or they go to war or something like that, you'll see a tent with a large spike in the middle. That also traditionally was called a pavilion. So we've got the pavilion leading up to this point right here. As I turn the stone around, it's only one point. That point is called the culet. Here we have a comically large piece of topaz, and you can see this is very similar to the previous gem, the piece of kunzite. And you'll see that there is a table on top, you see that the crown right here, and there's a girdle right here, and lots and lots of facets everywhere on the pavilion. But what's the main difference? If you look down here at the pavilion, you'll see that it's not exactly a point, it's in fact a long line. This is what we call a keel line. So if you don't have a culet, no point, it's not a singular point. From this direction it's a point, but from this direction it's a line. This is a keel line, just like on a ship. So in a ship, you've got a rudder at the back, which is a board that steers the ship. You'll see that there's a long board in the middle that keeps the ship going straight in the water. That's called the keel. So here we've got a keel line instead of a culet. On this piece of tourmaline, you'll see the exact same. From one direction, it looks like a point, but from the other direction, it's a long line. This is, again, a keel line. You'll see in front of me that we've got two more gemstones that are not the same type of shapes that we were seeing before with lots of flat facets. This type of cutting is what's called a cabochon. The parts of a cabochon are a bit different from faceted material. It still has a girdle down here at the base, but everything above that girdle is just a dome for the most part. Oftentimes you'll see below the girdle there's also other material. This isn't perfectly flat. With more expensive gemstones that area can be quite a bit larger. But when you're buying cabochons, do look at the area below the girdle. If it's too large, that's not weight that you're getting to see, but it is weight that you're going to be paying for. So especially with something like a star sapphire, you have to be careful that maybe 30% under the girdle is okay, Maybe that area, that weight, is important to keep the star in the stone. But if it's more than 30% below the girdle, 
you're just paying for weight that you don't get to see. So again, you can see that the base is not perfectly flat, and that's okay. The advantages of not having a perfectly flat base are that it actually makes your stone a bit tougher. If the angles on this base aren't perfectly flat, they may be able to take more glancing blows without chipping. So a little bit of a round base is not a problem. So a cabochon really is just domed cutting. It's a polished gemstone that's in a dome. Before gemstones are polished or cut and faceted and all of these things are turned into a cabochon, you have them in the form that you see in front of us right now. Now these could be pebbles that you find in a river. These could be shards of a crystal that are clipped off. This is what sapphire actually looks like before it's cut sometimes. And right here we have some agate. You can kind of see the growth bands right in through here. This is what agate looks like. It's just a shard. And then right here we have, I believe this is fluorite. Anyhow, all of these pieces are what we call rough. So gemstone rough is really just any gem material before it is cut. So what else is out there in the world of gemstones? You can see in front of me there's this piece that we call a specimen. Now a specimen is gem material on top of or in its mother rock. So this area right here is the crystal that they would actually use. It's very lightly colored, you can see, but the crystal growth is very, very distinct. You can see that it has a definite geometric shape and a gem material on top of the mother rock like this is worth quite a bit to some people. If you get a specimen like this with many different crystals and the crystals come to their natural end point, that's what's called terminated crystals. So over here in this piece of quartz, it's actually got some petroleum and carbon in it. These points, these are not faceted. This is actually naturally how the crystal grows. And this is what's called a terminated crystal. So if you have a specimen on mother rock that's also terminated, that adds to the value of the specimen. So this is a piece of quinzite rough. It's actually interestingly quite thin. You've seen a lot of big stones, right? But some of these stones, uncut though they are, still only grow in long, thin pieces like this. So this edge right here, this is uncut by man. This is just how the stone comes out of the earth. And this is also a terminated stone. And this right here is a fluorite specimen. You can see that the crystals are in these interesting square shapes all over the specimen. And as we turn the specimen over, it's got mother rock and some mud and sand and all these other things. Isn't that nice? All right, everybody, that's all for Gemology for Schmucks. Once again, my name is Peter Nelson. Thanks for joining me today as we talked about the anatomy of a gemstone. And I hope that this will help you as you go and you start to browse online or if you talk with gem dealers about their stones. That way you know clearly what areas they're talking about and you don't have to just go, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like if I were to start talking about cars and I, yeah, the carburetor. My brother looks over at me and says, they haven't put those in cars for decades. Ooh, the shame. But no, no, no. Today we're pushing out that shame. Now you know. You'll be accountable for it next time. I'm gonna start throwing out words like pavilion and keel line and, and table and all of these things. Don't forget your crown. Everybody needs a crown. Especially me, king of schmucks. Goodbye.